My name is Lily Iliev. I work for Wikimedia Deutschland in the field of politics and law. And on behalf of Wikimedia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to the fourth event of the series of events, Networks and Politics. We are very pleased to support and host this event again, together with ICANN, whose representative will also introduce himself and as well as our outstanding guests today. And yes, um, I'd like to wish you a pleasant discussion and an insightful debate afterwards. And um, a pleasant afternoon. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Adam Peake. I work for ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. We support events that um, network and politics organize because they're exciting and interesting, and this is particularly exciting and interesting. So I think we might have helped supply the food and coffee and tea. So please enjoy it and enjoy the event and look forward to many more of these. Thank you. So, good, good midday, everyone. Um, my name is Lorena Jaume, and together with Julia Pole, who's out there, uh, we decided that civil society and academia needs to meet more and interact more with each other. So we created this sort of series, and we're very thankful to the committee and ICANN. Um, and I'm also very thankful to Julia for all this logistics and thinking work we've been doing for the last four this time for for sessions um, it's always um, a pleasure to get people from the outside to come to germany and to bring new perspectives into german debates and um, we are very very happy to have this year this year it's the first session of the year um, professor luciana floridi um, in conversation with professor Jeanette. hoffman let me introduce you our speakers uh, professor luciana floridi is the Oxford Internet, um, Internet and Society, uh, Internet, Internet Institute, um, the Professor of Philosophy and Ethics of Information at the University of Oxford, where he's also the director of the Digital Ethics Lab of the Oxford Internet Institute. Oh, I said it right. Still in Oxford, he's uh, the Distinguished Research Fellow of the Yuhiro Center for, for Practical Ethics of the Faculty of Philosophy, and he's also a research associate and fellow in information policy of the Department of Computer Science. Outside of four, he's faculty fellow of the Alan Turing Institute and chair of its data ethics group, adjunct professor of the Department of Economics at the American University, Washington, D.C. And his research, as the name says of his chair, um, concerns primarily information and computer ethics. He focuses also on the philosophy of information and the philosophy of technology. His lifetime project is a tetralogy, this is not his term, um, on the foundation of the philosophy of information called Principia Philosophiae Informationis. And one of the books um, that has been a bestseller for the last two years is The Fourth Revolution, How the Infosphere is Reshaping human reality, which is a book not for philosophers, so if you are interested and curious to know more, go buy the book, you will be able to understand it. It's really, um, for a philosopher, a very accessible uh, book. Um, and Florida is deeply engaged with emerging Polish initiatives also. So he's not only an academic, but he's very much engaged also in applied ethics, so you making ethics applicable to the real life. So he's very much involved in many projects that have a political dimension, like um, he's been working closely on digital ethics with the European Commission, the German Ethics Council, and in the UK with the House of Lords, the Cabinet Office and the Information Commissioner's Office, as well with multinational corporations, the big ones, Cisco, Google, IBM, Microsoft. Tension, you might know him from the... Um, from the um, Google Advisory Board on the Right to be Forgotten. He was one of the most present faces uh, at the time when it was discussed. And Professor Jeanette Hoffman, she is one of the leading voices in the field of internet governance. She's been written extensively on this issue. She's a political scientist. She heads also the group, the Internet Policy Field as a, at the Berlin Social Science Center. And she is also one of the founding directors of the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. 
She is a John Lee appointed professor of internet politics at the Freie University at Berlin. It took a while at the university to understand that this is an important field and they got Janet. Good, uh, well done. Um, and she also is very well known for her political engagement as well on internet politics and digital politics issues. She's been the member of the Enquete Commission on Internet and Digital Society at the German Bundestag. And um, one of the latest publications, uh, her latest publications focus on conceptualizing internet governance and the emergence of internet politics as a new policy domain in Germany and the role of trust in global regulation on the internet. Thank you very much for being here. I look very much forward to your conversation. My image of how to approach this is of a building, a very complex building with various floors, various apartments and functions in these apartments. And we don't have that much time, so we will see just part of that building. And we will start with a sort of macro perspective, um, trying to situate that building in a certain time. You talk about the fourth revolution, so we will start with that. We will then carry on through the corridor, look at what you mean by data ethics, and then approaching the kitchen, where we would actually like to gather and have a conversation, and talk about data ownership and your understanding of it. And if we have enough time, we will also look at the regulatory implications. If not, it will be up to you to sort of explore that part of your work. So let's start with the fourth revolution. Perhaps you want to give us an overview of what you mean by that and how it is characterized. Certainly. Uh, and thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I could spend quite a bit of time thanking everybody, and they would deserve all their waste of time, given the long introduction that they gave about ourselves. But I will spare you, you know, that, that sort of longish thank you this, thank you that. Just Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> this is a privilege to be here. And in that context, uh, you know, to interact with you. Uh, and we can start walking around the building <laughs> together. If anyone gets lost, uh, ask the, <laughs> the owner of the building where we are. So um, in terms of um, uh, positioning the building, shall we say, in, uh, in the history of uh, our way of thinking, um, I, I should premise probably that uh, I come from a tradition that uh, believes that there are only really um, only two teams that play philosophy, the Greek team and the German team. <laughs> and either you are with one or the other, uh, but there is not much else in that sort of top league. Uh, anything else is kind of second league. Uh, trust me, even in Oxford, that doesn't go down well, but that's it's a fact. So um, what I'm going to say is a bit more German than Greek um, in positioning the building. It all starts in terms of this fourth revolution from uh, um, realizing that the kind of um, transformations that we are undergoing um, have got not so much to do with um, what we can do with the world, like, oh, I, I can talk to my mom on, on Skype, that's so cool. You don't build a philosophy on that, certainly not the sort of top league philosophy. Um, but realizing that the, the technologies are actually, at some point, um, changing our self-understanding. Uh, that what we are producing now, this new digital revolution, is more significant than many other technologies we have undergoing because it's not just about our interactions with the world, but it's about other three things. How we make sense of ourselves, so how we conceptualize ourselves, our self-understanding, how we make sense of the world, how we conceptualize the world, and how we make sense in other words, conceptualize our interactions between ourselves and with the world. So these other things, that's what the digital is really transforming radically. And here I come with the an, an answer to the fourth revolution. So thinking of, along those lines, you can tell that it's a bit more of a German way of looking at the world, not like deep thinking, foundational thinking. Um, that year in Marburg has left uh, well, <laughs> quite a, an impression on me. Um, in what sense, the fourth revolution? Well, 
this is always simplifying, and if you have read the book, I'm sorry, you're going to get the story again. Um, but the three previous revolutions were actually put together by Freud, who at some point said, look, we, we have changed our uh, self-perception already twice, and I'm bringing the third revolution on board. The first time, we say science and technology changed the world, um, was with Copernicus. Uh, we thought we were at the center of the universe. We're not. And that wasn't meant to be a philosophical, no, kind of self-understanding who I am in the universe sort of uh, moment, but it did. It did change that profoundly. We sort of backtrack, we retrenched into a, a different kind of centrality. We like to be mm, at the center of the party, and the party became the animal kingdom. So, okay, we are on this small place in the middle of nowhere, but we are at the center of no, animal life, the, the biological sphere, the biosphere. And of course, Darwin comes and says, uh, in bad news, no, you're not at the center of that either. And then Freud, who put the two other guys together, that's a good sort of way of selling your product, said, well, I'm bringing you a third revolution. We're not at the center of the mental space either, now, for obvious reasons that is not probably necessary to explain here. So that third revolution was a reconceptualization of who we are. We're not at the center of the universe, not at the center of the animal kingdom, not at the center of the mental uh, space. So what about the fourth? Well, that, that's what essentially uh, became quite obvious some time ago. The new, the new technologies, the digital, computer science, ICT, et cetera, are shifting our centrality from the last place we had, at least so far, our centrality within the infosphere, within the sphere of information. We thought we were the only one who could play chess, uh, the only one who could uh, park the car, buy uh, at the best fridge online, uh, make more money uh, financially by uh, trading online, cyber, et cetera. And of course, the new technologies are coming, and I say, well, not really, you're not at the center of that either. You no, better start getting used to, say, talking to um, automatic response machines or having your life decided by an algorithm, etc., without overtones. But that centrality is gone. When you hear that the cab driver has his identity challenged by the driverless car, then, then you can see what I'm talking about here. So we're not at the center of any of these four spaces. And philosophically speaking, you may get where we're going here. Like maybe it's time to learn that we're not at the center of anything, that being cool is not being at the center of the party, but for later on, to organize the party. That is the cool thing. So being there for the other, sorry for the pathetic moment, it's a bit cheesy, I know, uh, but that is the point. That is exactly the lesson that we should learn from our digital technologies. We're not at the center, we are at the periphery, we are at the service of, we're not being served. That is quite radical, even though we never stop to cherish the idea of distributed systems, right? In principle, we like the idea that there is no center, but most of the organizational structures we surround each other with are distributed, thereby taking away control to some extent. Yes, and that, so the, the kind of um, infrastructure that we are, um, shall we say, in, enjoying, so to speak, um, has this double movement. On the one hand, it, it takes away some control. On the other, it mm -hmm. really makes us feel we are at the center. That's the advertisement sort of uh, business. Yeah. Any advertisement uh, that you have, any... Uh, persuasive technology must make you or me feel important. Uh, remember, because I'm worth it? Yeah, thank you, L'Oreal. That's exactly the point. No, you're not. You are a grain on, of sand on the beach, but you're not going to sell a new perfume to the grain of sand on the beach by telling your role here is not that important. Whether you wear their perfume or not doesn't make any difference. And yeah, you can smell or not smell. That's okay too. That's fine. Uh, that's not going to go anywhere. Uh, so you have to be the beach. You are the thing. And at that point, because I'm worth it, becomes the second movement in this. On the one hand, I'm manipulating you so deeply that you uh, don't even understand it by making you feel at the center of this game. Oh, bad movement. One, two. In this dialectic, we regain a fake centrality where that centrality is exploited by people who feel that by making me feel at the center of the game, 
they can use me better. Not a good plan. So would you call that a sort of narrative of the fourth revolution? I think that's the, the nasty side of the fourth revolution. That, that's what we don't get um, right if we miss the opportunity of understanding this anthropo-eccentric view. If we still stick Perhaps to... Perhaps you should explain that term yeah, a bit so more. If, you, if, you, if we still stick to the anthropocentric view that we are what is really worth talking about all the time in Think about now how we change all this in a variety of contexts now, say in the environmental context, where we were there for nature to serve us, and that didn't go well. Uh, well, other contexts we may explore. As long as we keep that sort of fake narrative in mind, then the, all the persuasive, manipulative, nudging, Nobel laureate, anyone, uh, no, methods and, and mechanisms are there to make us feel more relaxed, that we are important, that uh, Alexa really is talking to me, yeah, uh, and and that I'm so important. That is not the narrative of the fourth revolution. It, to me, is the wrong side of not getting the philosophy right, not understanding how critical thinking should make us reconsider all this in a different way. Actually, I should ask you now about uh, your idea of um, the information organize, uh, organism, sort of the human being as, but I would like a question to ask another one before. And that is what this, your understanding of the beach actually means for our enlightened understanding of self-determination, which is at the same time actually an important element of democratic theory. Yes, so, so this uh, idea that we are not... That each of us is um, is a bit of a, a node in a network, just to use a different metaphor. And if you remove all the links, there is no node. Okay, so it's not like um, I I could I could be without being together with. That idea means that um, we should be way more um, careful, gentle, nice towards these special nodes, because each of us is incredibly fragile malleable. We can be easily influenced to go one way or another. Most of the times when, I mean, unless you are a stubborn idiot like myself, um, if you go to a restaurant, you don't know what you want to have. And most of the times you order something, oh, this maybe that, or you are on Amazon and Amazon says you like this, maybe you also like that. And uh, maybe you like the first Harry Potter, uh, maybe you want to read the second Harry Potter. And you no, know, I'm pretty open-minded uh, or flexible. I have the need to read something, and I read the second Harry Potter. There's nothing wrong with that. But having read the second Harry Potter, I'm going to be recommended, guess what, a third Harry Potter, and the fourth, and the fifth. And by the end of no, years of reading Harry Potter, I haven't read anything else. I read Harry Potter. It wasn't a plan. No one schemes. There's no big brother. But I'm malleable. I came up with, a, like, what shall I read today? And it became Harry Potter all the way through. Guess all the stuff I haven't read. Uh, so when it comes to the individual and how protective, not in a paternalistic sense, but in an environmental sense, we want to be towards the individual autonomy of that particular node that each of us is, well, that becomes crucial not to have all that constant nudging pressure, do this, do this, do this. And the more we live in a world with technologies that are very efficient and very stubborn, the more we are the ones that are going to adapt to these technologies, not vice versa. Now, this is all quite clear, uh, and therefore it becomes a matter of policy. It's not a matter of saying, oh, and that's the way it is. We can't do anything. Not at all. There's plenty of freedom in uh, making you know, all this, designing the kind of society we want to have. It's more like the, det the determinism of, if you put this in place, this follows. You don't have to put this in place in the first place. Maybe the premises don't have to be there. But if you start with these premises, that's what happens. If you start having, essentially, your readership uh, influence by whatever Amazon is suggesting, at the end of all those years, you would have read or Harry Potter. Does it have to be that way? No. Do we have an alternative? Yes. Are we going down that road? Yes. Alternatives. <laughs> I suppose. But perhaps before we go further down that road, you can explain your concept of the human being as an information organism. Yes. Uh, so this requires lots of premises uh, to make clear, sure that I don't mislead anyone into thinking that uh, I, I have a strange metaphysics in mind. 
when I say that any, uh, any of us is, uh, is an information organism, that I am, you are, uh, I'm not saying that that's all we are. Of course not. So the analogy here would, that can help is that uh, when I was a kid, I was told that uh, I was um, what, 80, 85, 90% water. That's the chemical perspective on an individual, which is true. I mean, basically, can we say I'm 80 kilo, kilos old? Oh, I'm heavy, not completely true, but uh, aspirationally, um, of those 80 kilos, now most is water. And that's the end of the story. Does it mean that that's all I am? Of course not. But it's a chemical level of abstraction or perspective on the individual. So when I say I am an informational organism, I'm adopting a more sort of um, 21st century perspective, which is not chemical, not biochemical, but more like informational. And therefore, when we treat each other, say, uh, in the infosphere, it's much better to understand each other as informational organisms that live, prosper, flourish, or suffer, depending on the flow of information that is going through, not because that's all we are, but because that makes a lot of sense today. That's the kind of perspective you want to have to design, for example, a different kind of politics. Informational organisms that react, prosper, exchange, live by, the flow of information that is in the environment makes a lot of sense, much better than not a lot of water. So what would have been the alternative before we entered the digital age or the fourth revolu revolution? At that time, you would say we would not treat each other as information organisms? No, I think we would. that, that, that makes a lot of sense and it would have happened anyway. But I think that um, in, shall we say, in the 90s, just to have a bit of a frame of time, we had an opportunity to go social and political in the construction of the digital space. Mm -hmm. We didn't take that road, and I don't think it was any one stupid mistake. It was very difficult at the time to realize that the digital, say, internet, for example, or anything else along that line, the web, the social media, etc., wasn't a utility. We, everybody you, you spoke to in the 90s thought, oh, it's like... Like electricity, water, um, oil, you name it. It's, it's crucial, but we create a market and then we regulate. It was a mistake because um, you, you don't live on electricity, but you live online. You live on Facebook. So this, the digital has actually created not services like any other. They have created the space we inhabit, literally. Not, not, like, that's where we spend our time. And by creating that space, they have created all the socio-political conditions of governance of that space. But because of the 90s, shall we say, problem, we let that go as in, hey, it's just another market, we'll regulate late, later, and now it's a bit too late. Now, essentially, we had created that space from a business uh, logic, which is okay for many other reasons, and from, shall we say, a very um, American-centric or Californian-centric perspective which is also not terribly bad, but not exactly a plan. What do we do next? Uh, maybe we need more questions on this. First, I would want to ask whether you mean by we chose not to become political or sort of look at it in a political way. Would you say these would regard the conditions of the informational organism, sort of the way people interact with each other as informational organisms that this is the part we did not regulate or look at in a political way? I think more in terms of the, the infrastructure uh, that is among us, that then makes us information organisms. It was really very much a chance of, say, building the net as a, as a social net, uh, owing as a society, essentially the infosphere. Um, well, we are in the right place, you know? Like, these kind of things could have happened not just accidentally once, it could have been the reality. We could be you know, in the, say, Facebook Deutschland Foundation that is working like you know, Wikimedia. It, we're not. And that was, that was the chance. So it, it's more like uh, the environment could have been constructed uh, in a sort of sociopolitical way, whereas we let that digital environment be built from a business perspective, uh, own privately. At that point, there's a disjoint between who we are, informational organism, and where we live. We, us, anthropologically now, we understand ourselves as informational organism, but we live in a space that is totally private, owned by companies. What that is the but about? 
Hmm? What is the but about? You said, but it's a commercial. Well, the thing is that um, the, the commercial enterprise in building the space we inhabit uh, has different rules. It's for profit, which again is not a bad thing, but it's not necessarily, say, altruistic, socially oriented. It's um, not accountable to the citizens, which again is not a bad thing necessarily, but it's accountable to uh, shareholders, not stakeholders. Now, you get in a different direction. You basically get into, shall we say, a supermarket as opposed to a public park. There's a difference between a supermarket and a public park. Uh, and the rules that govern one and the other, accountability, transparency, uh, how you change the rules if you don't like the rules, uh, what happens at some point we'll get there to your data when, once they are in circulation in that particular space, your behavior, I'm not, I'm not picturing this as you know, good guys and bad guys, don't get me wrong, I mean, or, or the horrible California, that's, that's silly. Uh, but it does make a difference. Uh, it's a totally different kind of perspective, as in what is good for the environment when it comes from society as opposed to, say, uh, business. I would like to see the two things working together. That's also most of the work I do to and fro between academia and uh, uh, the corporate world. And I think there is hope for that. Um, I just, I wish we had a more sort of incisive political approach to this, uh, more courageous approach, saying we as society politically, we would like to not own, but supervise what's happening in this space. Because it's a social space. It is insane that until recently, not so much now, but say before Trump election, we would get lines such as Google, I'm a library catalog, Facebook, I just connect people. They don't say that anymore. No, they get mature as we speak. And I, I, I trust all the individuals there knowing that they want to do the right thing. So, and remember, I'm, I'm in the advisory board, I'm on, on that side. But having said that, that was the kind of logic that we were getting by building this social space from a business perspective. Like, it's not my fault if something goes wrong. If you own the park and something goes wrong in the park, well, it is partly your fault. If the park is dirty, it is your fault and it needs to be cleaned up. So I'm not completely convinced that a purely not business-oriented, profit-oriented, uh, and especially one side of the whole culture, that which is very Californian culture, not even not American, is all we need to make this space uh, prosper. It's okay, it's, it's one piece of the whole puzzle, but where are the other pieces, especially the political ones? And I'm talking not just Germany, I'm talking about the European level, where we are so um, shy to, to intervene. We have, and I cruise here, we have zero political um, uh, intervention, and it's totally legal. It's like saying, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but if you do something wrong, I'll have a big stick called the European Court of Justice or antitrust. Once you have your politics about the space you inhabit regulated only by law in terms of you know, um, disincentive to do the wrong thing, you know that there's no plan. It's not like telling people what to do. It's to say, uh-huh, whatever you want to do, and you don't tell them, don't do this. And it's a very poor, minimal approach. It's, I like to see more. I wonder where society is in your equation. You talk about the commercial sector and how powerful it is and how shy and weak our European regulators are. But I would say from a, um, society, from a social STS perspective, say a science and technology perspective, we always would sort of attribute a lot of power also to the users who can accept the service, might even shape to some degree the services they use. I mean, Facebook would be nothing without all the people using it on a daily basis. <clears throat> and that brings me to my next question. How would you say moral expectations have changed uh, with the entry of the fourth revolution? Do our moral standards change? Is that part of what you would describe as the fourth revolution? So I think there are two points here. Uh, one, the civil society, where, where it is and what it's doing, and the other one about the, the how has ethics changed, and if it has, how? Uh, if I can tackle the first point, no. Civil society at the moment is, um, is so disappointed with politics, shall we say, that is disengaged. Um, unfortunately, politics is one of those things that, um, as the, there's a whole bunch of phenomena 
relational phenomena, where the negation of the phenomenon is part of the phenomenon. Sounds weird, but silence is an act of communication. If you ask me a question, I don't say anything. That's a, that's a, a big message. Yeah? And not voting is a political act. So it's, it's part of that kind of a bunch of things. So in that context, civil society stepping out is a huge political move. It's not like saying, oh, no, we don't. You meet people say, I'm not interested in politics. There is a huge political decision you just made. Uh, so in this trivial sort of self-referential uh, problem, the detachment of civil society from political engagement, end of the ideologies, etc. a long story not for today, means that politics is particularly weak precisely also because civil society, as it were, the engine of politics is not there. Or if it is there, it's more in terms of uh, staying away or, say, protest uh, of all kinds, from Brexit to five stars, from what happened here you know, with uh, the recent, recent elections to Catalonia, etc. So it's, it's a negative approach. So in that sense, one way forward is to re-engage civil society with politics, capital P, and you know that's maybe for another day. It's a long story. In terms of the ethics, the ethics that I would like to see sort of not really changing, but shall we say a little bit of an upgrade, so becoming more mature, is that s story that I told you about the fourth revolution. So once you once we realize that we're not at the center of um, any space that we inhabit, does that not generate desperation? Like, oh, I'm useless, I, it, there's no meaning. No, no it, you can regain an amazing meaning, which is the meaning provided by your interactions with something else that you put at the center. Bear with me, because there are plenty of examples out there. You speak ordinarily to people in almost any job, you know, the teacher, the doctor, um, the civil servant, uh, or parents. And what they do in terms of ethics, they don't put themselves at the center. It's not the teacher, oh, it's me, and then yeah, the classroom, yeah, it's just, uh, just they're there for me. Of course not. The doctor doesn't put herself or himself at the center, puts the patient. The parents don't put or shouldn't put themselves at the center, they put the children. So step number two, put the other at the center. Objection. Well, I put you at the center, you put me at the center, and this ballet, we never get into the rest. No, you first, no, you first, no, you first. So apart from the joke, um, there is something odd in putting each other at the center. So how do you get out of this? Step number three, you put the relationship at the center. So in politics, it's not about one party putting the other party at the center. It's putting politics at the center and the value for society. At that point, if all the parties are around and at the center there is the well-being of that society, then we're talking capital P. Then we can reconstruct that joint civil society politics for a different ownership of the space we inhabit. Go back to an earlier metaphor you used, we should look at the full beach. Yes, so uh, at that point, uh, the beach is the... Uh, union of all those grains of sands, none of which is important in and of itself, but all together in their relationship with others, provide the beach. It's the same thing with the network. That's the way we, sh we think today. We don't think anymore in a sort of Newtonian mechanistic way, you know, no, little pieces coming together, building something more complex where every piece is a standalone. That's a Newtonian mechanistic view of the world which we have quietly, culturally abandoned. Today we think more in terms of networks. First the relations, the links, and then the nodes. First the roads, and then the roundabouts. Well, in that context, how you build those relationships is exactly influencing that inforg, that informational organism above. You put the people in the right conditions, in the right environment, you start building the right links, and all of a sudden those individuals you now prosper and flourish. You deprive those individuals of all the right links, all the right relationships, and guess what you get? It's really not that smart as a move, trust me. I mean, it's really quite simplistic, but we're not making it, and that is frustrating. Let's carry on on our corridor towards the kitchen and talk a bit about information and data. First, it would be helpful if you explained how you actually define those two concepts, which are very important. Sure. Uh, so uh, let's talk uh, about the distinction between data and information first. So um, this is a bit 
boring, to be honest, uh, but uh, at least we get the vocabulary right. Uh, so data, um, if you really push really, really hard all the way to the bottom, uh, data uh, are a collection of differences, full stop. It's a, it's a black dot on a white page. It's a light in the darkness. Uh, it's a zero instead of a one. So it's a difference, and that's all there is. As long as there's total uniformity, imagine a universe in which everything is white. Well, you would have no data. Or anything is 100% fully light, zero data. So as long as there's a difference, that is a datum and lots of differences, lots of data. That's the bottom line. So the kind of ontological bottom line of what is a datum or data. But once those differences acquire some structure, they don't come randomly, not ping pong pong, but they sound like beep, beep, beep. All of a sudden you have a syntax. That the distance between the data, the frequency in the, in the sound, for example, or in the order of the zeros and ones, that's called no, the structure and that's the syntax. So data plus syntax. I'm missing something. Do they have any meaning or it's just random? As in no, this random order, meaningless though. Now, this order in the clouds, is that, but it's not that the, that order in the clouds no, really looks like a cat. So if the data, beep, beep, with a structure, that kind of, uh, they start meaning, oh, that's, that's a heartbeat. Aha, uh aha, -huh, uh -huh, okay, oh, that's, that makes a big difference yeah, as opposed to something else. And that's semantics. So information, at that point, you can define it as meaningful, well-structured data, the data being a difference in the world. So you have the differences, they're well-structured, and they have a meaning. You can stop there, and that covers all three kinds of information. Are you still with me? Told you it was boring. I mean, I do remember when I just may inter intervene here that people used to define information as exactly that. That's what makes a difference. Um, it seems that why you, because you want to emphasize the importance of data, you yes. sort of... So data, at, at bottom line, unless you have data, you have no information. There's nothing information there unless something is structured and has meaning. However, there are three kinds of information, and that's where confusion normally you know, arises. There's the kind that we find in the world, like say the ring trees uh, that tell you the age of the of the plant or my uh, fingerprints. There's a structure there, and you know that um, this information as reality, as as reality, is out there in the world. It might have a meaning, for example, the age of the tree, or someone actually touched their glass because I found the fingerprints there. Then there's information uh, for reality. Imagine a, a music uh, script, or an algorithm, or a recipe for a cake. That is not in the world. It's something that you use to make something that will be in the world. No, you follow the recipe, data, the letters, with a structure, the syntax, with a meaning, and bingo, you have a cake there. Mm, there is one cake that I do well, so uh, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just in case, I saw a few skeptical uh, people here. Uh, then, then there's another thing, which is the information about the world, and that's normally what we mean. If no, no one gives all this blah 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 philosophical, and this and that and the synthesis, that's what we mean all the time. Is the queen of concepts, which is information about the world. Is what did you have for breakfast this morning? Oh, a cappuccino. Well, that information is about the world. It's not part of the world as a reality. It's not for the world, but it's about the world. Normally, every information we have is in, a, in this 3D space. So if you have um, something called information, it's a bit there, it's a bit for, and it's a bit as and about. What we emphasize, that depends on the context. But normally, if you don't say anything, you're just speaking to someone in the street, uh, can you give me some information about the next uh, um, bus? That's what we mean, now the about, semantic, factual, and at that point, we expect veridical. And that's the last night thing I'm gonna say. So there's a huge debate philosophically about should information be true or not? If something is not true, does it count as information? And normally get, people get confused, why? Because they're talking about data, or because they're talking about information for the world. An algorithm is not true or false, inevitably. Yeah, it might be more or less correct, but that's another story. 
Or they might just look at the you know, fingerprints and so say, how can that be true or false? Is or isn't? I know. I'm talking about, about information. Is it true or false that you had a cappuccino for breakfast this morning? And if it is true, that's information. If it is not true, that is misinformation, disinformation, whichever way you want to call it, and it's not the real thing. Try this one. next time you go to the doctor and says, uh, do, do I have a, say, uh, a flu? And he tells you something completely rubbish. You go back and say, you tell me something rubbish. Well, you didn't tell me that you want to have true information. Yeah, good joke. Before we, got to we get totally lost in our complex building, let's talk briefly about how your understanding of information is related to the identity of the human being. Because that is the step Perfect. we need yeah. to understand your concept of data ownership. So reconsider of the three the idea of pattern. In other words, something out there that has a particular structure and is ontologically there. It's not about, it's not for, it's as. When, when I speak about human beings as, or myself, as an uh, inforg, I'm talking about the concept of ontological information. I'm a pattern made of bits of information which may or may not be totally private, some of which are, are shared in common with other people, some of which you know, I can release to the environment and there is no problem, but there's a core that that's me. And that core, I would like to have a bit of saying on how it's handled. It's almost like saying, look, there's a kernel in this pattern of information that is you, that you should be able to sort of, uh, manage intelligently. Uh, in a long and different context, I would say that that's a way of reading Kant. You read Kant in terms of autonomy, and that control, the self-understanding and the ability to control yourself is about not necessarily your body, really, but it's about who you are informationally. Your memories, your experiences, your taste, your expectations, your fears, your hopes. That kernel that makes you only you. When it, the closer, it's more like a, an atom, it's like more cloudy, don't get me wrong, but the closer you get to the kernel of that atomic view, you know, that you, 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 the closer you get, forgive me for the joke, to the bone of your privacy. So it's not like uh, anyone has the same degree of privacy that anyone else, but we all have a moment when you say, no, no, that's beyond the threshold. That's too close to be me, to be shared with anyone whatsoever. I want to share it with my friend or with you or with uh, just my parents or whatever. That is the info that I'm talking about. It's constitutive of the individual, the information that they have. And insofar as the information is me, that I own that information as I own my hand, not as I own, say, my tie, then that makes me who I am. And that's why I would like to be way more careful in how we handle this. Remember where we, where we started? All those um, uh, persuasive technologies, they get really close to the kernel. In fact, they would like to get all the way in. And I think we should put a bit of barriers and protections because it's a very fragile entity. It seems that the kitchen where our ultimate destination might have two doors. Another door that you mentioned in this article that I read this morning comes via human dignity. And I think that is a really interesting concept also for those who are familiar with data protection regulation because you question the way that um, data protection experts would justify or explain privacy. You come via a different door. Perhaps you could add a bit to that. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is part of um, the work that uh, I'm doing with other colleagues um, for the uh, EDPS, which is the European Data Protection uh, uh, Supervisor, part of the European Commission. The work that we're doing is on the, sorry, lots of acronyms, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Uh, and um, in that context, um, the issue emerged uh, of why do we want to protect privacy? I mean, what's, what's the foundation of privacy? Uh, uh, why is it a good thing? And I'm on the side of those, or shall we say, I'm the, the one who has proposed the, the view that we should anchor privacy, and therefore the protection on that special kernel that is you, 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 informationally, to the concept of human dignity, not to the concept of ownership. And here the distinction, not because one is wrong and one is right, uh, right, but because one, I think, cuts more deeply. Ownership, you know, 
I just gave you the example. It could be just the ownership of my car. I uh, basically put up a barrier to what you can do with it. You no know, uh, ownership as the the right to uh, forbid anyone else to use what I you know, possess. Um, but I can sell it. Uh, I can give you some away. away. Uh, you you can run with it. You can give it back to me. Now I would say that in the same way as part of our bodies are not up for sale, no matter what, no matter what market says. And no matter how much you want to respect the individual, oh, but it's my body. Can I not be a prostitute? No, you cannot. And I don't care. As always, that's very paternalistic. Yes, it is. Now, welcome to the real world. Because you, with your human dignity, represent also part of humanity. So, so I can't sell my liver? No, you cannot. Uh, for a, no, a thousand different reasons, including pressure from the market, etc. So at some point, if you treat the analogy here, there's a certain amount of data that I own but as I own my liver, it's me, it's part of me. In that sense, I want to have that protected by regulations because the market will put pressure. Will put, no, so just give it away a little bit more, it doesn't matter, just a slice of liver, another slice of your liver. No, at that point, the human dignity sort of anchor helps to justify why we put limits to even something that might seem to be a bit paternalistic. At the end of the day, it's my liver. No, what has society got to do with it? It's yours, but it's also human. No, dignity in question. And we shouldn't go down that road. You give a very good explanation of what you mean by human dignity. Perhaps you could sort of add on to that, because I've, I found it very convincing. Well, I'm not sure whether that, uh, that, that is exactly what I, I, I have in mind now. Is that I, I wrote that article. Uh, can I read just, it? Just a, I can Just a little bit it. of time ago. And I, I hope I haven't changed my mind. But if you, if you think that that's, <laughs> that's good enough... Uh, <laughs> what you say here... Each of us, as a beautiful glitch, is a fragile and very pliable entity whose life is essentially made of information. Our dignity rests on being able to be the masters of our own journeys and keep our identities and our choices open. And that is the key idea, that we are always in the making. If I may explain your article to you. Um, and in order to be able to do so, we cannot sell the information that is, if you want, the resource of reflecting on who we are and who we want to become. We need a certain space, I would say, also for experimentation. And if there is no privacy, we lack that space to be humans in the sense of uh, developing ourselves. Uh, I know what you're referring to, yes. and. Um, um this uh, might be less obscure, no, the, that sentence, uh, thank you for no, having that note there, uh, it, it becomes less obscure if you compare what was the alternative. So if privacy becomes essentially, as most of our American colleagues understand it, more like a degrees thanks to which the social machinery work, that's not a bad idea. So it's just a matter of different perspective. I disagree, but it's not like appalling. It's more like the idea that insofar as I have some information that I want to share with other people, sharing it is a matter of facilitating social relationships. And therefore, it's pretty much an economic view. Do I give it away? Do I sell it? Do I sort of um, uh, share it with other people for free or not? Well, that's only yes or no insofar as it makes the social machinery work more efficiently. Very economic. If you have a more like um, instead of a philosophy of economics kind of perspective, a philosophy of mind, which is the one I, I embrace there, perspective, well, no, it becomes more a matter of ownership as constitutive. And the beautiful glitch idea is, a, is a, my attempt to provide a catchphrase, shall we say, that puts together a few things. One, that uh, we are a glitch. We shouldn't be here. Now, you look at the history of this universe, and it's, maybe we'll change our minds. Maybe there are trillions of other no, species like us all over the place. So far as we know, there aren't. And we're really weird. I mean, really, really odd stuff here. Now, you know, take any other animal. They are so much more like each other than we are like them. No, not an attempt, remember, this is the fourth revolution, not an attempt to put ourselves at the center of anything. That's why the glitch, we're beautiful. But we are odd. We are the outlier. Not because we are the center, but because we shouldn't be here in the first place. So somehow, 
is important and this somehow is crucial because it divides between people who have a faith or don't have a faith, religious kind, somehow, and it could be a plan, I'm not excluding it, not for me, but somehow we got here by this mechanism that by trying a trillion and a trillion and a trillion of combinations made a mistake and created consciousness, freedom, intelligence, you know, um, empathy, uh, emotions, what we are. Is it a glitch? Well, for some people, um, I come from that tradition, I'm no longer Catholic, but I used to be. Uh, no, it isn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a bug, it's a, <laughs> it's a feature. <laughs> uh, it's not a glitch, it's, uh, it's a project for other people like me who have lost that particular perspective. It's an amazing sort of uh, fact that we are here in the first place. Insofar as that glitch is there, whichever reason you want to have, it's very fragile. And I keep saying this, we should be way more gentle uh, on stepping on that particular glitch regularly. Now, if you look around ourselves, maybe because our technologies are just at the beginning, um, we will do better in the future, but they are brutal. I mean, insofar as uh, they are information technologies, and we are information, they are technology of the self. Uh, not my definition, I'm borrowing this from Foucault. Uh, he had a different idea, but I like the expression. So they are technologies of the individual and the glitch. You put all this into the same soup and inevitably the glitch suffers. More and more, the less rules there are there to protect it. So that's the idea. The um, connection between the beautiful glitch, the personal identity, information as considered of myself and uh, human dignity means that we can build a whole framework that makes a lot of sense that is not necessarily the commercial, business-oriented uh, perspective that we have adopted in building the world in which we live right now. And that's not going back to your initial question, why it's so important to have a chance to change direction. Uh, we are putting ourselves under an enormous pressure and uh, uh, w we're not doing a good job in protecting ourselves. Now let's assume we have sat down at the table in our kitchen and first there are you and the European regulator. And you give a speech, a very passionate, emphatic speech to the regulator, telling why your concept of property, of data property, is so important. What is your expectation, what the regulator will say to that, coming from a regulatory perspective where we want to harmonize European market, you know, and uh, trading data, as they would say, making a distinction between personal data and non-personal data. So a market, a common market, a common market for data is quite an important thing that might expand wealth and uh, business. What would you say to the regulator? What the regulator would yeah. say? What, uh, is, uh, what will you say and what will the I, regulator... What I, what yeah, what you, I would say to the regulator. Now, you simulate yeah, a short yeah, before yeah. we yeah. allow all the others So what I would the recommend, kitchen. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend to the regulator, to the omnipotent regulator that we might encounter the, for a moment, let's hope, let's, say, let's imagine, I would um, recommend uh, uh, a couple of things. Um, one, um, uh, benefit sharing. It is inconceivable that this, now everybody speaks about this data as oil, yeah, maybe, maybe not, but, but if it is even close, remotely, well, we better start thinking in terms of Norway. You know how they deal with oil in Norway? Socially. So if their analogy sticks anywhere, this is not going to be you know, oil as in Texas, it's going to be oil as in Norway. It's everybody's oil. So benefit sharing, that's a good idea. And if they don't do that in other places, welcome to Europe. That's the way we do things here. Uh, so, a Norwegian approach to data as oil. Yes. Benefit sharing. Two, uh, things in terms of, just in case, you know, more concretely, for example, what we do with uh, all the uh, data we have on uh, um, uh, health care. Surely we want to have that data exploited. Yes. Whose benefit? Well, the whole society. And if there's some money to be made, fantastic, as long as you know, all the rules, et cetera, the taxes, and so on. So we can do this properly. Now, we've been here before with other uh, industries. So that's benefit sharing. Two, uh, I would like to see a little bit of a, um, a ring fencing of the data that really should not be treated. 
and no matter what, no matter how much money we can make, no matter, uh, shall we say, you know, uh, the kind of oil they should really leave under you know, the, the surface. That is not worth, because the value of extracting it will be so polluting, you know, in this analogy, that will not be a good idea. So something about personal identity, and we've been here before, eh? uh, is imagine all, we, all the stories that we had in the 60s and 70s about my um, sexual inclinations, my religious uh, uh, sort of in inclinations. There's something that's so much me that shouldn't be part of any commercial enterprise, no matter how socially beneficial that could be. So that's not counterbalance. So benefit sharing, yes. Some ring fencing of what shouldn't be in the market, absolutely. There's a little bit of uh, extra, um, maybe if I can get a third advice. Yeah, in the way, since we're here, why not? I mean, we can uh, be generous with advice. Uh, um, why don't we concentrate a little bit more on the known personal data? There's a huge pressure on extracting as much personal data as anyone can, and the usual companies come to mind. But the, the amount of data that we have on anything else is staggering. You know, things of uh, uh, like the environment, uh, pollution, uh, traffic, um, air control, uh, logistics. Are we taking real full advantage of all that, or are we concentrating on a little slice of this enormous sort of uh, bandwidth? And I have the impression that there's a lot of uh, attention to the personal because that is the commercial sort of business that we invented. Since we get the, the services for free, they have to be paid. They are paid by advertisement. Advertisement gets there in order to sell stuff. It sells stuff more efficiently if they know who I am, and therefore my data going to it and back again and back again. Well, that's, that's the engine that we have built that is totally skewing the whole debate about data. Because there's a lot of stuff that has got nothing to do with my taste for or against Harry Potter. And it's all about you know, how much traffic there is in Oxford. Are we really exploiting that? So my third advice to the regulator is like, can we just de-emphasize, no, put less pressure on all this data that are personal and more on non-personal data? How you do that? by breaking their model, and this is not going to happen. In other words, the advertising model through which most of our services online that we enjoy are fueled, it's a bad model. It's a self-reinforcing personal data exploitation that has its logic. You don't like the logic, well, you don't buy that particular model. Their model comes with their logic. Oh, and the regulator will reply to you what? And the regulator will reply to you what? Um, not now. We have uh, elections now. Uh, <laughs> next time. <laughs> okay, that was. Uh, that would be the reply, and I got that reply regularly. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, but not now because. Um, and there's always a bit of election somewhere in Europe that we need to take care of. So the door to the kitchen is now open. Please come all in, uh, have a seat, and uh, join the conversation. I hope you have a few questions for Luciano to answer. Uh, my name is Jash, and I come from the Hurdy School of Governance. Uh, I sort of would want to kind of put this question in the frame of the building reference uh, through which we had the talk. So let's say we are in this building in the construct of the fourth industrial revolution as information organisms. Uh, and now we have guests coming into the building in the form of the platform service providers, let's say the Uber, the Airbnb, and the Bitcoin. What would your notion of trespass be in this construct of the building? Um, how would you kind of enmesh the interaction of laws, norms, market, and the architecture in the form of the code in this? And how much of this would you place uh, as an aspect of how much we trust those guests to come into the building and provide a benefit out of that, and thereby we kind of rely and have an sort of an open door policy to let them in? But where does the kind of the boundaries between trust and distrust kind of creep in, and uh, how would you kind of put that? Yeah, thank you. At the risk of s being a bit too philosophical, I reject the analogy to begin with. It's not about trespass. Trespass, it goes back to ownership, to property. It's an old American concept, as we know, now 19th century, etc. as the idea that privacy was a privacy of my space, not metaphorical, my, sp my house, no, the ranch, the rifle. No, it come too close, I shoot at you. I rather talk about kidnapping. There's no trespassing in public, for example. But how do you protect privacy in public spaces? What trespassing there can be? Are you in a square? Yeah, but I can still have my privacy infringed. How? 
by being quote unquote kidnapped, different analogy. In other words, my information taken away from me and used for purposes that maybe I don't like, or maybe they are exploitative, or maybe they are manipulative and maybe they even contain a bias. So insofar as we start with the right analogy, shall we say, uh, at least in my view, so it is not about trespassing any boundary of a physical space that I own, but it's actually cloning or sort of uh, kidnapping, even in public spaces, my identity, say through a CCT camera for purposes that I didn't share or I didn't want, then it becomes a matter of control. It's not a matter of defense. And the control can be quite open-minded. I might be quite happy to have my data, as it were, taken from me for several purposes. As long as I have a sense of someone is overseeing the whole uh, process, and if something goes wrong, I can go somewhere because someone is accountable. What I don't like is the idea that my data I taken from me, and I have no way of saying anything at any time, no matter what happens. So I would welcome the default position saying, let's be open-minded and welcoming to anyone who wants to use this data, as long as we know what happens when something goes wrong. It's essentially not about making sure that everything goes well, but being resilient when things don't work. And I think that second perspective, like what happens when things break down, and they will, because we are humans, something will go wrong. There will have to be a moment of uh, rectifying, redressing the wrongdoing. Well, what's in place there? Do we have some resilience to counteract you know, the, the damages uh, caused or not? If the problem is all about uh, you know, making sure that everything works as opposed to what happens when something won't, then we have a problem. Then we have an, basically a bit of a uh, far west. That's, oh, it doesn't matter. The, the stuff you find on, on these companies are break things fast, always go like, no, don't break anything. No, sh so stay, stay, stay calm, so stay put, because it's my data you're breaking. Uh, and that's a bad idea, you know. Uh, so uh, fail often, fail fast. With whom? With, with whose data are being failed? Slow down, like, be careful. That would be my advice. Very powerful statement. Are there more questions? Otherwise, I would sort of like to drill down a bit more into the issue of healthcare to better understand your ethical principles here. Let's suggest, it follows on a bit of uh, what Uta said. Let's suggest, my feeling is that in artificial um, intelligence, we see a strong driver called optimization. Um, and that is sort of how we are caught into that new technology. We get big promises of how our life will be enhanced, how we will be able to better control our future, thereby reduce uncertainty by buying into this technology. So let's assume there are new ways of sifting through our healthcare data that promise us to tell more about our individual diseases, their likelihood, etc., and thereby also developing new medication to deal with this. So in that context, we would be asked to give away the kind of data you would define as constitutional data that I should, as an individual, really have control over. You give them away, uh, together with many others who also give their data away, and you have no way of knowing what third parties are going to do with this data. So what is your take on this? Because my feeling is that this drive towards optimization will make us look at our present life in a different way. We will see flaws, problems and weaknesses where we didn't see them before through the lens of technical progress. I like, I like the last point uh, very much that um, you see uh, things that are not good enough mm -hmm. uh, sometimes just because uh, someone showed them to you that they are not good enough. No, that say the, f the furniture in the house was perfectly fine until someone show you to you that oh no it's not good and fine and all of, uh, of a sudden you're disappointed and you want to change it so i think optimization is uh, is part of the shall we say the narrative of a business oriented way of constructing our space which again not terribly uh, wrong but we should control more carefully but about the first point um 
actually, this is um, a project that we are developing uh, as we speak uh, uh, with Microsoft on uh, uh, data philanthropy in the medical context. So I don't know whether the, uh, the question is accidental or, or, you know, uh, or accidentally right on target. Um, in this particular project, for example, uh, we are looking at the possibility of uh, having people donating their data for medical research once they are no longer here. Uh, uh, what happens after retirement, exactly? Now, so, so once you die, you can donate your organs. I would like to be able to donate my data to uh, research. Of course, with the all conditions that we know are in place for organ donation. If you tick that box and say, yes, when I die, I want to donate whatever is left, if it is useful, you know, for science or for health reasons, it's not like, oh, and it's going to be you know, uh, food for pigs. No, no, it's not. Uh, it's going to be something else. There's plenty of constraints here. It's not that we haven't done it properly. So I would like to see something similar so that I can tick that box and say, all my data, medical data, please, no, do with them whatever you can to improve other lives. It's one generation working for the next. I think that's, that's a good way of working with our society. I would be very sorry if, one, that didn't happen because we were too worried about sharing data, one of the you know, problems is uh, the opportunity cost that we are undergoing right now for being too cautious, and at the same time, we're a matter of, being, of exploitation. There's a perfect middle ground here where we do it in a sort of socially uh, uh, intelligent way uh, for the benefit of anyone, remember, sharing the benefit, and it's neither exploitation nor of a cautious attitude. At the moment, there is no box in Europe you can take, say, yeah, my data can go, no, no, just take them. I would like to see that happen. That's the kind of practical things that we can do. Uh, and it's no longer optimization, it's sort of altruism, no, beneficial, doing something that really won't cost you anything. We won't be there. No problem about my privacy, because I will be you know, joining a big beach, uh, that will be anonymized, and oh, but it could be de-anonymized. Yeah, good luck, so I'm dead anyway. So really, you're that keen to know who I am uh, uh, from those little things? And how much information can you extract anyway from my blood already? So a bit of realism, a bit of no, socially oriented perspective, and I think we can do amazing things here. Okay, then I would say thank you very much for this interesting debate. Um, we learned a lot, I think. Thank you.